Greetings and welcome back to room 303, Senior A English. We now turn to Unit 3 on page 236, Facing the Future, Confronting the Past. Our primary study of Unit 3 will be Shakespeare, especially his classic Macbeth. The question on page 237 that will be our focus question is, how do our attitudes toward the past and future shape our actions? Make sure you do on 238 the unit goals. On 239, you want to be paying attention to these vocabulary words, proficient, justified, diverse, catalyst, assertion. But we're now going to turn to our launch text on page 240, better never to have met at all. This selection, I'm just reading with you on 240, is an example of an argument in the form of a response to literature. This is the type of writing you'll develop in the performance-based assessment at the end of this unit. And as you read, look for evidence the writer uses to support an opening claim. Mark the evidence you find especially strong. Okay, let's read again. We'll have eight paragraphs here. We're wanting to do a paragraph outline. Obviously, you have no uh, section right there in your, in your consumable. Make sure that you are following along with me and taking notes as we go. We're actually going to begin with a text that we know from our freshman year study, R and J. In William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, love is fire. Of course, this is exactly what Romeo says the first time that we meet him on stage, isn't it? It burns through everything through the lovers of the title, through their families, and through people on the sidelines. By the way, do note, did you see your threes again, right? Just a, a, immediately an observation, a rhetorical observation in 2B. Notice, right away, if we're going to say that love is fire, notice it burns through three things. Through the lovers, R and J, through their families, the Capulets and the Montagues, and through people on the sidelines. Obviously, we think of people like Mercutio and Tybalt. The romance between Romeo and Juliet hurts so many people that one wonders whether it would have been better if time unwound and the two leads had never met. If we examine the play from the beginning, the evidence for this is overwhelming. So there's your thesis. The idea is simple. It would have been better for all parties involved to have never met at all. Paragraph two. Winding back the clock, we begin in Verona, where we find Romeo, heir of the noble house of Montague, feeling sorry for himself, his reason, Rejection at the hands of Rosaline, niece to Lord Capulet, leader of the House of Capulet and rival of the Montagues. Romeo's friend Mercutio, wishing to improve his friend's spirits, disguise, uh, disguises Romeo and sneaks him into a Capulet party. Romeo has his own motive for going. He wants to see Rosaline again. But at the party, he meets Juliet, daughter of Lord Capulet instead. From that moment in time, they're in love, and everyone's life gets worse. So your first exemplar, of course, is that from the very beginning of the play, Romeo is actually not in love with Juliet at all. You can go back to LearnStrong.net and watch our lectures on R&J, and we make this very point at the very beginning of the play. Romeo is not in love with Juliet. He doesn't even know she exists. It's Rosaline that Romeo is into. Paragraph 3. The first one to suffer is, ironically, of course, Mercutio, a, a member of neither house, but a relative of Francesco's ruler of Verona. He fights a duel on Romeo's behalf with Juliet's cousin Tybalt. Romeo meddles in the fight, and his interference gets Mercutio killed. Romeo, furious at his friend's death, kills Tybalt. So here's your second point of validation. Bystanders, people who have nothing to do with the families, end up dead because of Romeo and Juliet's meeting on a dance floor. Paragraph 4. For this reason, Prince Aeschylus exiles Romeo from the city and threatens him with execution should he ever return. The prince has his own plans for Juliet, a hope to see his cousin Paris marry the young woman. Juliet's family is also in favor of the marriage, as it would raise the status of the House of Capulet and bring them closer to destroying the Montagues. Juliet ignores her family's history, wishing to be with Romeo and no one else. This desperate, she plans a way for them to escape their families and disappear together. That is to say, Juliet, going against the wishes of her family, is obviously going to end up having her problems. And paragraph 5 will continue with poor Juliet. She swallows, Juliet swallows a special poison that allows her to appear dead for three days and then reawaken. Her family is shocked and grief-stricken by her apparent death. They put her body in the family's burial crypt. 
Romeo, hearing this, is struck with unbearable pain. Now life has no meaning. A messenger from Juliet who would have explained her plan never finds him. Time is not Romeo's friend, but timing mishaps in, this in these final scenes betray him. Notice that if, you've, if you're familiar with this play, which obviously we are, then reading this summary makes all the sense in the world. If you're unfamiliar with the play Romeo and Juliet, it probably is the case that a whole lot of what's being said here in this argument piece makes only a little bit of sense to you because, again, you, you don't have the proper background knowledge. Finally, we'll finish with the last three paragraphs. Paragraph 6. Romeo goes to see Juliet's body and finds Paris at her crypt deep in mourning. Paris attacks Romeo, believing him to be a vandal, and is killed in the fight. We've pointed out before that this is one of the tragedies, true tragedies for poor Paris. He has no idea that you know he's in the middle of serious problems. Romeo regrets killing him, though not enough to forget about Juliet's death. He drinks poison and dies. At this moment, Juliet awakens to find the now dead Romeo beside her. Horror struck, she takes her own life with his dagger. Obviously, we have a lot of damage and death at the end of the play, right? Line, uh, paragraph 7. Examined in chronological order, it's hard to argue that anything other than death and misery came out of Romeo and Juliet's relationship. However, Shakespeare would disagree on this point. His argument comes at the place very beginning where he writes, A pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventure, piteous overthrows, do with their death, bury their parents' strife. Thus, the miserable, painful deaths of so many characters and the grief of their friends and relatives lead to a lasting peace between the rival families. Future generations living without strife might consider the sacrifice a necessary step to a better age. And then finally, paragraph 8, Nevertheless, it's doubtful that Shakespeare's own dead characters would agree with him. Mercutio certainly would not. He leaves the world irate, saying, A plague on both your houses. They have made worms meet of me. Temple and Paris are creatures of the present, and no thoughts of impending familial reconciliation enrich their last moments. For their sakes, and for the sakes of the lovers themselves, it would have been better if that moment at the party, the moment Romeo first saw Juliet, had never taken Place. So we will end again with a restatement of the thesis. Now, of course, this is an interesting idea, and it's one that we deal with quite well in our, uh, uh, in our lectures on Romeo and Juliet, the complexity of this play. Of course, we have to balance this idea with what Alfred Lord Tennyson will say in memoriam, "'Tis better to have loved than lost than never to have loved at all." In other words, the experience was worth it all. Again, it's a subject of of some debate, and that's why it's an arguable thesis, right? I want you to do on page 240 your uh, vocabulary and your word network for time on page 242. Take care of that summary there to summarize. The, the, the uh, page 243 question is the one that I want you to, um, to, to spend a little bit of time with so we can talk about it. What is the relationship of human beings to time? Go ahead and give some thought to that, and we will turn then to our overview of the historical period of Unit 3, the English Renaissance. Thank you.